All right. Well, why don't you grab your Bibles and you can open them up to Acts chapter 14. That's where we're going to be today. As we uh, get in there, I don't uh, want to assume that everybody has been with us the entire way through the book of Acts. I just just to take a brief moment to catch you up. Acts is such a fascinating book and a very helpful book. It's the kind of book that when it was written, uh, it, it was the New Testament of the first century. And I know for a lot of us, we look back on the Bible and just think, okay, yeah, a bunch of stuff that happened a really long time ago. But one of the helpful things about the book of Acts is that it really is designed to be our story. Acts is, is what we've been born into. It's, it's how our faith is to be shaped. It's how it's supposed to be lived out. We look to the book of Acts for the kind of Christianity that we're supposed to be living, even though culture has changed, the world has changed. There's a, a heart and even a, a mandate to how we carry out our faith that we find in the book of Acts. Luke writes in the very opening, he had written his first book to a guy named Theophilus, just filling them all in on the life of Jesus. And he said, in my first book, I've written to you about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then he launches into what Jesus continues to do and teach through his spirit and through his church. And that's what we're reading and studying and spending time on. And today in, in Acts chapter 14, there's a, a pretty cool moment where we go into an area, and that area has a lot of significance. That physical geographical area has a lot of significance. And to help understand the significance, we're going to go all the way to chapter 16 and to start in chapter 16, verse 1. So you can put your thumb in chapter 14 and go to Acts chapter 16, verse 1 and see what it says. It's very simple. It says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. That's where we'll be at geographically today. And it says, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. What we get in Acts chapter 16 is uh, a young man named Timothy that's come to faith in Jesus. He lives in a, a region that holds the towns of Lystra and Derby. Now, just if you're trying to wrap your heads around that, anytime Lystra is mentioned, Derby is also mentioned. Anytime Derby is mentioned, Lystra is also mentioned. It's kind of like Newbury Park and Thousand Oaks, even though they're separated by a little bit more space than that. These two cities are a region, they're together. And Timothy is from this region, and what we're going to look at today in Acts 14 is the first time the gospel goes in to that region. And so what we get to see is the kind of faith, the kind of Christianity that Timothy, one of the key disciples that we see in the Bible, was born into, what he was brought into. Now, Timothy is very similar to a lot of us. He was most likely not alive when Jesus was alive. So at this point, we're about 14 years after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and Timothy at this stage is likely between 11 and 13 years old. He's just a, a kid in Acts chapter 14. So this is a, a pivotal moment because that's a young man that didn't even have a chance to see Jesus or hear his teaching. A lot of the things that have gone on in the book of Acts have had eyewitnesses connected to it. This is Paul who was already a generation out, preaching the gospel to Timothy, who's now multiple generations out, and we're starting to get into some of yours and my experience, places where they're so far removed from Jesus himself that they're totally dependent on the preached word of God to even understand who this Jesus is. And so Timothy's brought into a story. Now here's the thing. Each of us has been brought into a story of faith. The people that preach the gospel to us, the first churches that we went into, they, they shape our understanding of Christianity. For some of us, we're brought into like a, a very missional or missionary mindset where we have this understanding of the gospel needing to go to the nations. Some of us are brought into like a, a worship, a high Holy Spirit, prophetic context where there's a, a deep love for the presence of God. Others might be brought into a, a very strong teaching context where the Bible is brought on a consistent basis over and over and over. And we get these beautiful cultures that are formed. But a lot of times our culture can also be shaped by the world around us. I spent 10 years in student ministries before uh, planting the Anthem Church, and I spent a lot of time talking to students about Christianity being born, just being brought into like, yeah, you just show up at church every week, sing the same songs, pray the same prayers, read the same Bible kind of there. And then I've led Anthem Church for 15 years, and I've had a lot of conversations with adults that are like, you know, you just kind of read the same Bible and pray the same prayers and give the same offerings, and it just kind of happens. And this 
honestly, it absolutely breaks my heart to think about somebody being brought into a Christianity that is not the most compelling life you've ever heard of. There's something about this that, that changes not just who we are and how we might think about eternity. It changes everything about the life that we're here to live, our purpose, our function, and how we go about it. I would love for us to be able to, to hold up what is the Christianity that I was born into against the pages of Scripture and to let the things that don't belong fall away and to maybe adopt some of the cultures and truths of the Christianity of the Bible into our lives to start living according to this way as opposed to the way that maybe became really familiar to us. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read Acts 14, verses 1 through 28, the whole chapter. And then we'll spend some time looking at this, uh, this Christianity that Timothy was brought into. What would he have seen? What's the culture that he would have been born into? All right. Acts 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycomia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, I'm assuming because he was ripped. And Paul, Hermes, <laughs> I don't know Barnabas' physical condition, uh, Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of light nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the, the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. All right, just as you are reading the scripture, something to know about all that, the names and places is if you say them with confidence, then you're pronouncing them correctly. So you just, just go straight through whatever comes to your mind. You say that and be bold and you're right. You're always right. All right. Um, let's talk about what Timothy was saved into. Four things that I just I want to point out. The first thing is that Timothy was saved into a powerful story. He was saved into a powerful story. The second is that he was saved into a global story. 
The third is that he was saved into a costly story. And the fourth is that he was saved into a community story. Those are the things that we're going to spend some time looking at. So let's start with him being saved into a powerful story. We see in verse 3, it says, So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Signs and wonders. I would use that phrase all the time to talk about miracles or prophetic words, things that are supernatural in nature. That, that take the story out of what's right in front of you and take it to a, uh, a truly beyond our human lived experience space. If you were to look at global stats, we're at a kind of like an all-time low, I don't know about an all-time low, but a recent modern history low of true atheists. Globally, overwhelmingly, the population believes in a supernatural reality, that there's something beyond the physical body, something beyond the physical world. The vast majority of the world has a spiritual mindset. There is a power that's out there. We even saw it with the people. They, they see the miracle with Paul and Barnabas, and they start calling them Zeus and Hermes. There's a, a supernatural reaction to what they saw, and then Paul just takes it and says, no, not those gods. Let me point you to the true and living God. But this powerful story is a reality. We see it again. They go and meet a crippled man that has not walked since birth. And Paul tells him to stand up, and he sprang up. His legs started working. I'm not sure what your experience is, this idea of a powerful story. Sometimes our lived experience can feel pretty limited. We don't see these miracles happen or experience them, and so it can just feel like, oh, clearly that's, that was then, and this is now. I realize that in the position that I'm in, I get to hear more stories than many of you do, and I just want to, want to share one just to show you, to tell you that this powerful story is real and still exists. We have a young woman in our church who's 19 years old, and in her 19 years, she's had over 100 surgeries on her feet. She has a condition on her feet. She can't run or jump or walk on sand. Like, her feet are very tender. She said, I mean, imagine that. In 19 years, having over 100 surgeries on your feet. And she was telling me this about six weeks ago. And I asked her if I could pray for her feet. And she said, of course. So I prayed for her feet. And uh, just a, a few weeks later, I was picking Lily up from Anthem Students. She's one of our staffers at Anthem Students. And she came running up to the car. She said, Matt, I went to the doctor. He took a fresh x-ray. He said, I don't know what happened, but it seems to have fixed itself. You can go run, you can go jump, you can do whatever you want. She said, she said that, absolutely not. She said, I went straight to the beach and I walked on sand for the first time in years. Now, I, I hear this story and I just, we don't, we don't know why God chooses to heal some and not others, but we do know that when God chooses to heal, it's to further his name, to advance the gospel going forward. We get this opportunity to understand that God breaks through. He, he opens doors for people to do life differently from time to time. I know that there are so many people in the church that have asked for what, when am I going to be healed? Sometimes God breaks through and he says yes, and sometimes he says, like he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in your weakness. And we don't get to always decide which is which. But we do hold to when God does break through. We want to acknowledge that he did that very thing. He broke through. We are a part of a powerful story, a supernatural story. Now, what's helpful is to understand that we're also a part of a global story. Because sometimes those things don't always happen in our midst. They don't always happen in our local church. But, but Paul introduced Timothy to a global story. So first, Timothy was born into this. He was saved into a story where the very next town that Paul goes to after healing the crippled man, he gets a chance to share the gospel. So Timothy is fully aware of this miracle that's taken place, these signs and wonders, and it's part of what his faith is built on. We also see that he's a part of a global story. In the first century, if Timothy was between 11 and 13 years old, his world would have been about, about this big. Just living in his town, doing his thing with no real access to news except what's brought through the Roman uh, announcements that would take place. There's just no 
I was not a big world around. Honestly, it wasn't really that big, except about 100 and whatever years ago when radio came out, we started hearing stories from around the nation through the radio. And TV comes in the mix, and we start seeing these stories and seeing things happen from other parts of our country. And satellite TV comes, we start seeing things from around the world. The internet comes, we start experiencing other people's lives. And our, our worlds, as they say, have shrunk to where we can live in a way that feels truly global. I was on a Zoom call with 15 Albanian pastors a few weeks ago, and they were speaking English to me. These guys that have never left Albania were speaking English on a Zoom call. It's a, a surreal experience to just have that kind of global meeting where there's an opportunity for us to talk to each other. That was not the case in the first century. So Paul comes into Timothy's life, and he brings Jerusalem and Antioch, He's been to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and the other Antioch. He's been to Cyprus, and Perga, and Pisidia. He's bringing these communities into Timothy's life and lifting his eyes to see that he, when he steps into the life of Jesus, is a part of a bigger story. See, what's interesting is in chapter 16 and beyond, Timothy will actually join Paul on his journeys. At roughly 14, 15 years old, Timothy gets on a boat with Paul and starts traveling with him all around the Mediterranean. He'll end up becoming a leader in the Ephesian church. This is a young man that becomes a, a global traveler for some of you that, whose world is this big to actually seeing the, the nations. This is part of what our faith is, is that we are a part of a story that's bigger than ourselves. What can happen is if uh, we're in a church that doesn't necessarily see the global story and just we live in our own world, God can shrink. His power can shrink. The stories can shrink. I shared a story of a healing in our church, and I'll, I'll tell you, just in the last six weeks or so, I've heard now three different stories of healing just from our church community. We've seen these, these happen just here. But before that, it had been a couple of years. And you can start to feel, if, if your world is just your local community, you can start to feel like God's not actually moving all that much. But when you recognize that you're a part of a bigger story and you start hearing about what God is doing in other places, you realize it's not just out there, that's, that's our story. I'm on a uh, WhatsApp with people from all over the place, our Genesis Collective Global Prayer Team. And we just get to hear reports of what God is doing in Nepal and Dubai and Sri Lanka. South Africa and Costa Mesa. We get to hear these reports of what God is doing all over the place. And it, it lifts our eyes and builds our faith to be a part of a bigger story. I don't know if you, what you thought about us going to Albania. We're about to take close to 60 people to Albania. And honestly, like this is probably a low average, but it probably costs each person about $2,000 to get to Albania. If you do some quick math, 60 times 2,000, look at that, you might think $120,000 to take people into Albania to be a part of a global gathering. That is a massive investment. That's a lot of money. Is that really worth it? I'll tell you, this is something that our team has prayed over. We consider that. That's a, that's a lot of resources to ask for from people to be a part of a global gathering. What we believe about Anthem Church is that God has put a mantle, an assignment on us to be a church that raises people up into the story that God is writing in their life and commissions them into what he's asking them. And to do that, we know that we need to be a part of a global story to keep our eyes fixed on what God is doing. We've asked him, and he's led us into this. We believe that what we are doing is saying yes to what God has asked of us and that it is worth the investment. I don't know that every church would make that same decision, and I don't know that every church has to, but as we have understood what God has asked of us as a church, we see this global story that, that God is bringing us into, and we want to say yes to the opportunities that are presented to us. We don't know what the impact is going to be on this church. I trust that in a few weeks when our People start coming back from Mexico and from Albania. We start coming back from these places. There are going to be stories of faith. 
there are going to be stories of hands being raised saying yes to what God is asking of us, both here and in other parts of the world. We are excited to see God build and bolster our collective faith, even if we're not the ones going. God's going to use these things to build our faith. And that's what Paul brought into Timothy's life. He brings these nations into his life. He's actually bringing a, a different kind of story and showing him a different kind of way. We also see that it's a costly story. Verses 19 through 21. It says that Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, so Jewish leaders from two previous cities come into Lystra because they actually they chased Paul into this new city and they persuaded the crowds. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So just to, to speak to this, stoning is a practice that goes back thousands of years. The ancient Near East, it was practiced in a lot of cultures when somebody in a community uh, was needing to be executed for whatever reason, they would throw rocks at that person until they were dead. And not just like pebbles, they're, they're heaving rocks at a person until there is a pile of body and rocks on the ground, and that person is dead. This group of people did that until they believed that Paul was dead, and they dragged him out of the city and left him outside of Lystra, assuming that he was dead. The disciples go and gather around Paul, and he stands up, and he goes back into the city that just threw rocks at him, and stays the night, and then the next day he goes to Derby and preaches the gospel. Now, as far as we can tell from Timothy's story, Timothy is from Derby, and this would have been the moment that he heard the gospel for the first time. It's from a bloodied, bruised, and broken Paul coming into his city and saying, Jesus is so, so good. Now, again, I don't know what we're saved into. <laughs> I say this, and I'm, I'm careful, I'm not just trying to be funny, but for some of us, we're saved into a picture of Joel Osteen with his perfect teeth and his perfect hair saying, you can have your best life now. And trying to preach Jesus by saying, well, come to Jesus and you will experience all the blessing, all the goodness. The flow will come to you if you say yes to Jesus. And there's quite a different story that Paul's preaching when a bloody bruised and broken man is standing up and saying, don't you want to follow Jesus? He's full of life and goodness and he's where truth can be found and he is the hope of the world. How different is that? Now, there's a full-blown prosperity gospel that preaches that if you give to God, he will return to you tenfold, fiftyfold, or hundredfold. That's a prosperity gospel. It's wicked, it's evil, it's all over the world, and it's doing damage everywhere it goes. It's a false belief that if I can get money out of you, God will give you more money than you give to me. Most of us didn't get saved into the prosperity gospel, but a lot of us got saved into a prosperous gospel. So we live in Southern California right now, but even in the United States, a lot of us just come from this story that and we live a, a life full of comfort and wealth. I grew up in Thousand Oaks, California. I was born in Tarzana Regional Medical Center. I went to college and got my master's degree totally paid for by my great-grandfather who set aside a college fund for me. We wrote my last check out of our college fund. I actually paid $700 out of pocket for my master's degree. My entire college and grad school was paid for by my great-grandfather. I recognize the epitome of privilege and opportunity that was given to me if it's in my mind that God blesses those that are faithful. And then I go to Nepal and I worship Jesus alongside people that have just as much faith and they have literally nothing. They have nothing to their names. Their, their worship community is not in a beautiful building like this. It's in corrugated metal with dirt floors. And they've woven together some, some cloth or some, some blankets to be able to sit on something that's not dirt. And they bow their faces on the ground and they worship Jesus and praise his name. If I look at that and say that there's something wrong with their faith, there's actually something wrong with my theology. That is beautiful. 
good and God is lavishing his inheritance on them in the same way that he is on me and all my privilege and all that's been provided to me. My theology has to stretch to understand that both of us are experiencing the grace and the goodness and the provision of God. Paul preached the gospel as a broken and bloody person and invited Timothy to experience that. And Timothy's answer was, yeah. Where do I sign up? I don't know what you were saved into. I don't know what story you saw that, that drew you into the gospel. But it should be in our frame of reference that the story is a costly one, an expensive one. It does draw on our resources. We're generous and we give to those in need. That's a major part of our story. We want to live generously, so it's costly and expensive in that way. It's costly and expensive in time. I watched Jenny and her team give mm, 6,000 man hours to serving our kids in the last week. Just, uh, yeah, sorry, I won't bother. I watched them just pour and pour and pour themselves out just to bless, to bless these 96 kids and then to hope that the gospel would be poured into the lives of these, these kids. It's costly. It can be costly to our bodies costly to our, our physical bodies. I'm watching my dad's body break down as he's given himself to just going and preaching the gospel. And it's taking a toll on his heart. Like his actual, literal, physical heart, it's taking a toll on his body. It's a costly life that we have said yes to. And if our expectation is that we said yes to something that would be easy, that would make us wealthy, that would make us healthy, and everybody else will do everything for us, and we just get to show up and experience the goodness of God, we have been saved into the wrong kind of faith. Paul's demonstrating something very different from that. This is a costly faith, a costly story. We also see that it is a community story. Verses 21 through 23 says, When they had preached the gospel to that city, and it made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Have you been with us? Three cities that Paul's been persecuted in so far. Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. <laughs> this guy's a glutton for punishment. They go back into those three cities. And here's what they do. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. And saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. A couple of things going on here. Paul and Barnabas were on what is oftentimes described as a missionary journey or an apostolic journey. They were going to, from city to city preaching the gospel, seeing people come to faith. And then a lot of times they would stay for a variety of uh, weeks or months even a few years in Ephesus, they would stay for a while and kind of build up the church, and then they would go on, and the ministry would oftentimes bring them back into that city to strengthen, or if you read through the letters, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, those letters are written back into these churches to strengthen Romans, to strengthen 1 Corinthians, to strengthen these disciples. That's part of the apostolic ministry that Paul and Barnabas were a part of. But even that, they recognize that they are doing this work going and going and going and going. But there's a ministry of the local church that takes place day in and day out, week in and week out. Paul and Barnabas put elders in, in every church that they go to. This is a key part of their ministry. Now, if you're not familiar with eldership, it's it's an important part of the church life. I want to take you to Titus chapter 1. I just want you, I want, to, I want you to see a little bit about what an elder is, just to give you an idea of why this is so important. So Paul writes to Titus. This is another one of his disciples uh, much later on. He says, this is why I left you in Crete. Crete's an island in the Mediterranean. So that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So imagine Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and whoever he was with, went preach the gospel in Crete, and they keep going, and now it's writing back to Titus. I'm leaving you, Titus, to put elders into every town to put what remained into order, and this is what he's supposed to look for. If anyone is above reproach, an 
elder is to have a, a, a transparency in their life, to live a visible life, to be seen. That there's not hidden parts of their life, there's not things that people could question, uh, their character, their integrity, there's a, an openness. Being above reproach is living a life that's out there in a way that they're not going to be called on and questioned in their character. Uh, that's, a, that's a key part of that, above reproach. The husband of one wife, we've seen people do writing on this, that it's the, a one-woman man. So even if somebody were to be single, uh, there wouldn't be a, a pornography uh, situation in their life. This would be somebody that's devoted to uh, the singular concept of marriage, God uh, preserving sexual intimacy for marriage. That's a, a key part of the idea of a one-woman man. As children are believers, uh, that's better translated as children are faithful. Uh, it's been written about that we can't control our kids coming to faith in Jesus, but there's a, a faithfulness in the household, a responsiveness to us bringing up our, our kids. Not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So you're looking for elders that aren't uh, partying, that aren't drunkards, that aren't living wild lives or insubordination. They're not uh, living outside of the authority structures that they're in. So if they're in a, a job situation, they're actually a respectful employee. If they're part of the Roman government, for example, they're a respectful citizen. They're not uh, uh, against the charge of insubordination. Then he keeps going. He has this whole list. He says, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Look at this. Paul's writing to Titus, like, look for those men of utmost character. Why? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict him. Have you ever had a situation where somebody was teaching but their character was in question that brings their whole teaching into question? If somebody is not a person of integrity and they're bringing a the message, it creates all kinds of doubt and space for you to think, yeah, but you're not even living it. Why would I live that if you're not living that? How can this message be that important if it's not impacting your life? And Paul's looking at this and saying, if we're going to have these people that are guiding these communities, that are shepherding and leading our people through, we need people of the utmost character to do it because they are the ones that are going to be teaching the Word of God and correcting or rebuking people when they're off. And they can't be up against challenges themselves in these areas. They need to be walking in righteous life. This is so important because Paul is building, now you see it into Timothy's life, a picture of life in community. We're not just in this for ourselves, we're actually in this to come together around the people of God and be guided into maturity, guided into faith. There's a story of us walking together, people who will hold fast the word of truth and teach it to us and train us and equip us and prepare us for the life that God has entrusted to us. We're part of a community story. Paul actually continues on back, or sorry, Luke continues on back in Acts 14. It says that after they did all their work in these different cities, they sailed to Antioch, this is what it says, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is one of those moments where we actually see that the church that sends getting the opportunity to experience the blessing of being a sending church. This is a chance for them to hear from Paul and Barnabas who have gone out and gone into these cities and said, we saw these healings, uh, we saw this uh, crazy like Jewish false prophet and magician that was speaking against uh, the gospel and we got to see that Sergius Paulus come to faith in him because Bar Jesus went blind, they get to tell all the stories of what happened and Antioch faith is built up and that's how the community of God works. So sometimes the people that go, they actually bring those stories back into the church and the church's faith is built as a sending church because they got to experience that because they were the senders. A big part of our hope, even uh, this team up here in the Imago Dei worship team. 
We planted a modern day church for uh, 10 years, 11 years, do you remember? 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, uh, Daniel and Christy Jansen were here in Thousand Oaks. They're part of our leadership residency where we bring church planters in and do everything we can to equip them and prepare them and then send them out. Uh, in fact, Katie, who is standing right here, is Christy's sister. Uh, and so they went and they planted a modern day church in Downey, and here we are 10 years later, this growing, thriving church in South LA. We called them up and said, hey, we'd love to have some of your worship crew come out and bless us, and this amazing group of people just came and ministered to us today. That's a, a gift. That's the community of the saints that you've been brought into, because we are a part of a bigger story. We're connected to these churches. We're linked up with them. Their fruit is our fruit, and our fruit is their fruit. There's a bigger story at play. And I hope even in singing with them, you might be like, I don't know these songs. I don't know these people. Don't be grumpy. You don't know these songs, and you don't know these people, and that's a beautiful thing. Because we're, we're bringing in these cultures that are helping us see that God's story is bigger than our story. God's church is bigger than our church, and their faith can compel us to grow bigger in our faith, and that's a community story that we're brought into. My hope in saying these things is that you're even getting a chance to reconcile, what does my Christianity look like? Have I been brought into something that, that is a part of a global story? That's a, a part of a powerful story? Have I been brought into something that's a costly story? And a community story, because that's what we learn from Paul preaching to Timothy. He gives him this taste of life in Jesus. And I'll be honest, it is not boring. Timothy, in just a, a few short years, in Acts chapter 16, will get on a boat along with another guy named Gaius from, uh, from Derby as well. They'll get on a boat with Paul and they start traveling with him. They'll go all the way to Jerusalem and actually see Paul get arrested. Later on in his life, Timothy will be arrested. Hebrews 13 tells us that Timothy has just been released. We learn from Hebrews 13 that Timothy was put in prison at some point in his life and then released. We'll learn from 3 John. When's the last time we read 3 John? We'll read from 3 John that Gaius is an elder and is blessed by John. These ministries that they're brought into, they're a part of a big story. So what do you mean? I want to take you to Ephesians 4.1. Paul writes to the Ephesians. This is to one of the churches that he's been to. He says, I urge you, as a prisoner for the Lord, literally Paul is in chains, he is a prisoner for the Lord. He says, I urge you, as a prisoner for the Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. This is Paul's challenge to the church. That's not to the elders. He has a different challenge to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. We'll read through that in just a little while. This is Paul's challenge to the church. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. As you go out into this world, you are carrying the name of Jesus. Paul will call the Corinthian church ambassadors. There's this idea of being an ambassador for Christ. Well, you don't become an ambassador when you read enough scripture, attend enough classes, memorize enough verses, sing enough songs, give enough money, and then you can be called an ambassador. That's when we give you the name tag. That's not how that works. You become an ambassador of Christ the moment you say yes to Jesus. And Paul's challenge to you is to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called because people meet Jesus when they meet you. Now, maybe you're freaking out right now and saying, if I'm the version of Jesus that people are meeting, that's not a good thing. Well, here's what I want to encourage you to do. First off, Paul's challenge is walk in a manner worthy of a holy life. Let the scriptures and the spirit stir you and convict you and challenge you to live a holy life. Let these things mold you into something totally different than you are today. Be transformed, Romans 12 says. Be transformed. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling. But I don't want you to wait to be 
an ambassador until you're walking in a manner worthy of the call. If today you're following Jesus, but you're being honest, you're like, look, my life is not one that those people should imitate, then my challenge to you is to be honest with those people about where you're at. I am a follower of Jesus, and I'm being worked on big time. God's grabbed a hold of my heart, and there are habits and patterns in me that are broken. Let me point you to the perfect Jesus that I am following and chasing after, and be transformed with me. God does mighty work when we chase after Jesus. That's what it looks like to be a faithful ambassador to Jesus if you're not there yet. And guess what? Even Paul was like, not that I've already obtained it, but I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He loved to point to Jesus, but he would also happily point people to him and say, look, God's done a mighty work in me, but I'm not all the way there yet. I'm still chasing after Jesus. And you can see the exact same thing. I'm not a finished product. God is still working on me. I'm chasing after Jesus, but he is the truth and he's the way and he's the life. You should chase after Jesus with me. And we have a chance to speak life into people even if we are not a finished product. That's what it would look like to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Be transformed and point people to the one who does the transforming. Right, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to wrap up our time with uh, some response. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at a passage like Acts 14. Thank you for the, the culture and the context that Timothy was born again into. But I can't wait to see the life that he lives and just the, the, the picture of faithfulness of a, a generation. And I pray, Lord, that this DNA, that the seedbed of, of what you've put into his life would continue to have an impact on churches, even here to Anthem, even here today. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond.